Hey, it's Darius from CPAexamtutoring.com, home of the I-75 CPA review course. I'm always on the Facebook groups like the Fearless CPA Exam Group and the Fabulous CPA Exam Club, and I'm answering candidates' questions. So I put together five must-know multiple choice questions for audit. And question number one, without a doubt, accrued liabilities. An accrued liability slash accrued expense hits the income statement in the current year even though the cash won't be paid until the following year so you can imagine that the auditor is always looking for accrued liabilities that should have been recorded but were not and you should be thinking completeness assertion when it comes to unrecorded liabilities because the client is asserting that the books are complete, that all liabilities that should have been recorded at year end have been recorded, but the auditor is concerned that some were left out. So let's look at this question. It says Riley CPA is performing an audit of Ziegler Inc. for 2019. Which of the following should be booked as an accrued liability at December 31st, 2019? So the facts indicate that the auditor is looking for a liability that should have been recorded December 31st. Letter A, the bank's confirmation reply in January of 2020 concerning Ziegler's line of credit indicates that interest due for December 2019 was paid on December 29th, 2019. So a line of credit, the company borrowed money and now is paying interest on that line of credit back to the bank. And it says that the interest that was due for December was paid in December so that means nothing is owed at year-end for this and that would make the auditor very happy to know that they're up to date with this payment and no liability needs to be booked at year-end for this so this is one less accrued liability that they have to worry about let's go on to B before we go on to B see if it wasn't paid in December what if the interest due for December was paid in January then you would have an accrued liability that would need to be booked in December. But the fact that the interest due for December was paid in December, then there's nothing owed. So we'll go to B. Now B says employee pay for regular and overtime hours worked just before December 31st, 2019, but paid January 3rd, 2020 was not recorded in December of 2019. So now in letter B, it looks like we found an expense that was incurred in 2019 that'll be paid in 2020. That should be recognized as a liability at year end. So in this question, we're looking for something that was incurred as an expense in the year under audit, but not paid yet. And we just found it, didn't we? Because the employee hours for overtime and regular pay just before year end was not recorded nor was it paid, but it was incurred, so it's got to be booked. How do you know it was incurred? Because it says employee pay for regular and overtime hours worked just before December 31st, 2019, was not recorded in December. Well, it should have been. There should have been a journal entry there. Debit to wages expense, credit to wages payable. And the auditor's looking for just that, that kind of information, to point to an unrecorded liability. See, what would happen here is that the auditor would look to see if this was ever recorded as a liability in December. And if it was, then fine. But if it wasn't, that would point to an unrecorded liability because that needs to be accrued at year end. So the question wants to know which of the following should be booked as an accrued liability. Letter B should be booked as an accrued liability at the end of December. Letter C, during the final week of 2019, Ziegler recorded revenue for services actually rendered to the client in January of 2020. Well, that should not have been booked as revenue in December, but that's not an accrued liability. So be careful what the question's asking for. So letter C is going to require an adjustment, a correction. You're going to have to take out that revenue because it shouldn't have been booked yet. But the question didn't ask which of the following results in a correction or adjusting entry. It said, which of the following should be booked as an accrued liability? And letter C has nothing to do with an accrued liability. Letter C is premature revenue recognition. So C is out. Let's look at D. 
During 2019, a former employee sued the company for sexual harassment. Legal counsel has advised that it is reasonably possible that the company will be assessed damages. A damage amount can be estimated. Well, I don't know. There is such thing as contingent losses with lawsuits. Don't they have to be booked? Wouldn't that make for a great accrued liability at year end? Not so fast. Why? Because it would have to rise to the level of probable. The loss would have to be probable. And legal counsel is saying it's only reasonably possible. That doesn't rise to the level of probable. So that would be a nice footnote disclosure, but that will not be booked as an accrued liability. You see why this question is so important? You got it. So the answer is going to be B here. So we know the answer is B, but what we do here at I-75 is we always anticipate the next question based on the one we just did. So let's try this one. Steven CPA is performing an audit of Reed Corp, an issuer for 2020. Which of the following items below would Steven CPA likely conclude requires neither an adjusting journal entry at 2020 nor disclosure in the footnotes? So we're looking for something that's not an accrued liability and something that does not even have to be disclosed in the footnotes. Whereas in the last question, we were looking for an accrued liability. And if we found just something that had to be footnoted, we weren't going to pick that. In this question, we don't want an accrued liability or something that has to be footnoted. So let's start our search. Let's look at A. At the end of 2020, a major customer owing a significant accounts receivable balance filed for bankruptcy. The normal estimation of uncollectible accounts was not intended to address accounts of this magnitude. So, surprise, surprise, a major customer declares bankruptcy at the end of the current year. Letter A might require an adjusting entry. It would at least require a footnote. Remember, it's not a subsequent event because it happened when? At the end of the year. So, before the end of the year, the major customer filed for bankruptcy. So you would probably book this. You would have to a journal entry, which would change your amount of bad debt expense. But if you didn't do that, you would at least footnote disclose. We're looking for a choice that's not a journal entry or a footnote disclosure. So A is out. B says the issuance of a negative report by an analyst that resulted in a 30% drop in the client's share price. Now, is there a journal entry associated with that? Should it be footnoted at least? Doesn't seem like there's anything you would have to do for a negative report by an analyst. You wouldn't have to footnote it. You certainly wouldn't make a journal entry for it. So B looks pretty good right now. Let's go on to C and D. C says interest has been paid for 11 out of 12 months on a line of credit with the client's bank. Okay, well, we saw the line of credit in the last problem. But in the last one, the interest was paid by the end of the year. The interest for December was paid in December. Now they're saying interest has been paid, but for 11 out of 12 months on the line of credit. Well, what about the last month? What about the 12th month? That means there's one month of interest that's owed as of the end of the year. So that seems to require an accrued liability. You're going to have to debit interest expense and credit interest payable for the one month that's owed. But we're looking for something that's not going to result in an adjusting entry or a footnote. So C is out. D says a lawsuit was filed during the year and the client counsel feels the client has a possible chance to lose $5 million, an amount considered material. Well, it doesn't rise to the level of probable, but since it's possible, it's going to have to be a footnote disclosure. So we don't want a footnote disclosure in this problem. We're looking for something that's neither a footnote disclosure nor an adjusting entry, and the only one would be letter B. So the first two questions that we just did were related to each other in that they had to do with journal entries, accrued liabilities, footnote disclosures, loss contingencies, what has to be disclosed, what has to be booked as a journal entry, and what doesn't. I guarantee you that you're going to see something like that on your audit exam. I'm so sure that you're going to see a question on what we just went over that if you don't see it, I want you to hit me up at cpaexamtutoring.com, home of the I-75 course. I want you to hit me up here where it says contact us. And I'm going to say, hey, Darius, I just took audit and I didn't see it. And you'd be the first one to ever tell me that because it's always on the audit exam. Now let's look at question three. 
we're going to talk about the audit risk model, something that's always on the audit exam. What is the audit risk model? Well, audit risk is the risk that the auditor gives the wrong opinion on the financial statements after completing the audit. Even though they may have done a professional audit, there's still a risk that the CPA gives an opinion that the financial statements present fairly when they don't present fairly, when they're full of material errors. So what are the components of audit risk? We have inherent risk, control risk, detection risk. Inherent risk is the risk that the material errors are in the financial statements before considering any client controls. That's inherent risk. Control risk is the risk that those same errors are on the financial statements after considering that the client has internal controls. Now, there is still control risk and inherent risk whether or not the client was being audited by us or not. There's still a risk of the errors being there, and there's a risk of the errors being there after the controls are in place. As an auditor, all we could do is assess both of those risks. We assess inherent risk. We assess control risk. And those assessments is what we call the risk of material misstatement. The outcome of our assessment of inherent risk and the outcome of our assessment of control risk will equal the risk of material misstatement. It means how much risk do we think we're facing as an auditor that the financial statements contain misstatements. As a result of assessing inherent risk and control risk, we come up with a risk of material misstatement and determine how much risk we think we're facing. At that point, it's up to us to either lower detection risk which means we have to be more careful not to miss something in one of our tests, or we could leave detection risk alone, or we could raise detection risk if we think that the client did most of the work already by having good controls and not many errors, we could actually raise detection risk then. An example of raising detection risk would be procedures that are normally done at year end could possibly be done at interim periods, which means any old time during the year. That would be us taking a bigger risk that would be raising detection risk. Because if you do most of your testing closer to year end and you gather your evidence closer to year end, now you're lowering detection risk, you're being more careful. So now that we know a little something about the order risk model, let's look at this question. It's gonna be very wordy on the exam, so that's why I gave you one here that's very wordy. And in order to financial statements, the risk that the auditor's procedures perform to reduce order risk to an acceptably low level will not detect a misstatement that exists, and that could be material either individually or when combined with other misstatements, is known as what? Well, I told you it would be wordy. Now, the key to this question is that it says the risk that the auditor's procedures will not detect a misstatement. And we said that control risk and inherent risk have nothing to do with the auditor's procedures because they exist independently of the audit. So it has to be detection risk. Detection risk is the risk that the auditor's procedures performed to reduce audit risk will not detect a misstatement that exists. So C is the answer. Expect to see a question much like this on your exam, and it'll probably be very wordy, just like the one we did. Make sure you know that inherent risk and control risk are assessed by the auditor, but they can't be raised or lowered or changed at all by the auditor. All the auditor could do is assess how much risk he thinks he's facing by assessing inherent risk and assessing control risk. Then what the auditor could do is take that risk of material misstatement and respond to it by lowering detection risk if audit risk is too high or maybe leaving detection risk where it is or maybe raising detection risk if we're willing to take a risk and that means we can do some of our testing at interim periods. Now we're always trying to anticipate the next question. That's the difference between I-75 CPA review and the others. There's a reason why each and every multiple choice question is placed where it is in an I-75 video. And in a typical I-75 video, we probably do 20 or 30 multiple choice questions. And the next one is always an anticipation of the previous one. And that is how you'll gain confidence. So let's look at this one and you'll see then it's much like the one we just did. The risk that the independent auditor issues an inappropriate audit opinion 
when the financial statements are materially misstated is referred to as what? Is that C, the risk of material misstatement? No, the risk of material misstatement is the outcome of the auditor's assessment of what and what? Inherent risk and control risk, right? So the risk of material misstatement leaves out detection risk, but includes the auditor's assessment of inherent risk and control risk. So what we're looking for is the risk that the auditor gives the wrong opinion, gives an opinion that the financial statements are fairly presented when they're materially misstated. That's audit risk, isn't it? That's the whole big picture, audit risk. Audit risk is the risk that the independent auditor issues an inappropriate audit opinion. When the financial statements are materially misstated, we said they presented fairly. As for the wrong answers, detection risk is the risk that the auditor's procedures performed to reduce audit risk will not detect a misstatement. Either we chose the wrong procedure or we did the procedure the wrong way, or we relied on evidence in the procedure that was all internally gathered rather than external evidence. So you see why detection risk is wrong for this question, but it was right for the previous question. And risk of material misstatement is not the answer, and neither is control risk, because they only take care of part of the reason why we gave the wrong opinion on the financial statements. But the fact that we gave the wrong opinion, that's referred to as audit risk. And you're probably sitting there saying these answer choices are so closely related. Yeah, they are. And that's why the typical national pass rate for audit is 50% or less because most courses try to push memorization. Now, you're not going to memorize your way to passing audit. You have to be ready to look at a question and say, I understand what they're asking me. I know why the wrong answers are wrong, even though the wrong answers look good for a slightly different question, a question I had a few minutes ago, they're wrong for this question. When you can do that, that's when you're gaining confidence and you're ready to pass. Let me tell you what the AICPA is going to do. They're going to take a question like this or one that they've already released that looks just like this and they'll change one or two words in the question and it'll be a totally different answer. And we just saw something like that when we went from the previous question that we did where the correct answer was detection risk and this time the wrong answer is detection risk but the right answer is audit risk and there's detection risk laying there as the wrong choice, even though it looks like a good choice. And when you do these questions in the right order, and that's how you learn the topic, that's how you gain confidence, because you start to anticipate the next question. And that's the way they can't get you, because that's what they're going to do. They're going to change one or two things and give you the same question again. So if you're already studying that way, and you're doing what they're doing, that's got to be good for you. All right, we're going to stay with the audit risk model, and I'm going to ask you one more. Which of the following risks are not assessed by the independent auditor in an audit of financial statements? We got inherent risk, control risk, risk of material misstatement, and detection risk. And I'm not going to tell you the answer. You're going to tell me. I want you to get in touch with me and tell me the answer to this question. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the video channel. You can get in touch with me right here at the I-75 front office. And don't forget to apply for an I-75 scholarship if you haven't already. So get in touch and let me know what you think the answer to this question is.